This program is brought to you by Agnes Scott College. For more information about Agnes Scott College, please visit our website at agnesscott.edu. exactly one month from tonight on Tuesday, March 16th. So I hope some of you will come to that as well. Tonight, the ethics program, in conjunction with the Bradley Observatory, is pleased to bring you Brother Guy Consolano, who will speak with us about the ethics of exploration, planetary astronomy. I'd also like to thank, um, for a moment here, um, the Aquinas Center at Emory University for helping us promote this event um, and for hosting Guy yesterday. Brother Guy is an astronomer and planetary scientist at the Vatican Observatory. He's also curator of the Vatican Meteorite Collection. His research focuses on connections between meteorites and asteroids and the origin and evolution of small bodies in our solar system. In addition to writing many refereed scientific articles, he has also co-authored several books on astronomy for the non-academic market, including Brother Astronomer, Adventures of a Vatican Scientist, God's Mechanics, how scientists and engineers make sense of religion, um, and this book here, The, the Heavens Proclaim. Prior to entering the Jesuit order, Brother Guy amassed an impressive academic record. He received bachelor's and master's degrees from MIT, a doctorate from the University of Arizona, and he also held a doctoral research post at Harvard College Observatory. But neither his religious commitment nor his academic credentials have led him to take himself too seriously and if he doesn't convince you of that tonight, you can always go online and uh, go to Comedy Central's website and look at the um, December interview of him um, by Stephen Colbert on the Colbert Report. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Brother Guy Fonsal. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I warn you that this won't have as many jokes as the talk last night. Uh, it is a serious topic and it's a topic that I feel peculiarly unable to really address directly, especially in the presence of a lot of people here who do ethics for a living. I feel that my topic and my talk is meant to be more a series of case studies, issues where ethics have actually raised, their, raised themselves in my work, and I want to basically illustrate how ethical issues come up even in a field like planetary science. You know, most of the focus of ethics in science generally has been placed in the biological sciences where, where life, especially human life, can at times be at risk. And because also in the biological sciences, the stakes of being first with an important result can also be quite high in terms of not only prestige, but also financial result. By contrast, it seems odd to, at first to, for me as an astronomer to be talking about ethics because astronomy is a remote and a passive field with little immediate relevance for the lives of most people and not a heck of a lot of financial gain, I have to say. Um, you know, I, I took a vow of poverty, but it was no change in life from the life I was living before. <laughs> How can we worry about doing the wrong thing as astronomers when basically we aren't doing anything at all? You know, we're just observing passively distant objects. And certainly it's very hard to imagine a possible commercial value to the work we as astronomers do. For that reason, one of the nice things about astronomy is that I rarely have to worry about plagiarism or falsification in my science because the stakes are too small to be any worth anybody's while. You know, if I turn out to be right in some theory or observation, there are very few financial windfalls coming my way, and if it turns out I'm wrong, I hurt no one but myself. Our real reward is merely our reputation, the one thing that we put most at risk when we try to fake our data. And as you all know, it takes a whole lot longer to make a reputation than it does to lose one. And yet, Ethical issues can arise 
even in a passive science like planetary science. For example, in order to be tempted to unethical behavior, there has to be, I would say, a forbidden fruit worth grasping for. A temptation like worldwide fame or an issue that will actually matter to more people than just our fellow astronomers. There is, in fact, one current field of research where planetary scientists do have a temptation toward unethical behavior. In its contribution to environmental studies, in particular global climate change, planetary sciences does have such an issue. In this, it is, unlike our neighbors who work in stellar astronomy or extragalactic astronomy, in this case, our studies do hit close to home. So, you know, the, the question comes up, is the Earth experiencing a global increase in temperature on average? And if so, are the causes of this increase anthro anthropogenic, which is to say caused by human activity? This is, at a certain level, a question of planetary sciences. You can ask the question, what is an appropriate measure of the mean temperature of the Earth? You can ask the question, what are the trends in the data when local variations are accounted for? You can ask the question, what are the possible causes for such warming? You can ask the question, how important among these causes are human activities? The answers to these questions have serious economic implications for many industries, many nations, getting the answer wrong could mean risking, on the one hand, the fortunes of individuals, of corporations, or of entire societies. Or, on the other hand, it could risk the fate of the planet itself. The risks are certainly high. And various political and economic entities have come out very strongly on both sides of the issue. They represent the interests of those who are, on the one hand, most likely to suffer if extreme but unnecessary measures are mandated against, you know, say, carbon emissions. Or, if, on the other hand, the rising temperatures produce cataclysmic effects in the absence of those extreme measures, if it turns out that they actually had been necessary. In the absence of scientific certainty, and there is no such thing as scientific certainty, society must make choices. And it has to make the choices now. But of course, that's life. All of life is making important choices in the absence of adequate data. Whether it's your choice of what college you're going to go to, who you're going to marry, or what you're going to have for lunch. The consequences of making those choices can be quite serious to those making the choices long before the consequences of global climate change actually kick in. And so that makes it even more difficult to make these sorts of choices. And so we know what happens. We've seen this happen in recent years, uh, months. In a whole lot of situations, a scientist who states publicly that uh, global climate change is caused by human activity can be ridiculed in the blogosphere and punished by some funding agencies who find the message unwelcome and those who try to debunk the idea of global climate change might be, in some cases, rewarded with financial support from, say, oil companies and the like. But on the other hand, the same debunkers are also liable to experience being ostracized or suffer a severe loss of status from those and their peers who might accuse them of caving into these pressures, being bought off by that funding. I've seen both effects take place among my colleagues. And I just want to put, go on the record here is I trust my colleagues that they're all being honest, regardless of the, the snark they put in their emails or who's paying their bills. On both sides, I have to accept that they don't know how to fake their data, that they would not want to fake their data. And so the one accusation that I really object to strongly is the accusation of scientific dishonesty. There's too many people doing this work on both sides for them to be dishonest about it. I think the differences of opinion are honest differences of opinion. And incidentally, I'll throw in my own opinion here, which is that uh, most people agree the evidence of, of global warming in the long term is real. And I think we'd better hope it's anthropogenic, and we'd better hope it's human caused, because then we can do something about it. 
because if it isn't, then we're in real trouble. <laughs> but to give you an example of the other side, a scientist of my acquaintance a couple of years ago found evidence of an apparent increase in the temperatures of the outer planets. And this increase in temperature in Uranus and Neptune apparently has been going on over the last 30 years. And this is an increase that parallels the global warming on Earth, but obviously could not be blamed on human activity unless there happened to be cars and factories in Uranus and Neptune, which I kind of doubt. My colleague has had great difficulty in getting her work published because referees are afraid that its publication will weaken the sense of urgency to limit human pollution in our planet. And in a sense, I can see their concern, but it's standing in the way of real science. The astronomer in question doesn't think that global warming is explained entirely by a change in the sun's output. And in every, any event, she also recognizes that, you know, reducing pollution is a good idea regardless. She herself is worried that her work might be misused by those who would completely discount any human effect in global temperatures. But her ability to publish what is, after all, a straightforward scientific paper has become entangled with the larger politics of global warming. Um, this is an image of uh, Uranus or Neptune actually taken at the Vatican telescope. I thought I'd throw that in there because I took the picture. Other and perhaps uh, more uh, surprising examples exist in planetary sciences where ethical issues do impinge. Some of the work in planetary sciences is laying the groundwork for a perhaps far distant future when humanity will actively be working beyond the Earth orbit and possibly exploiting I, I, commercially objects beyond Earth orbit. And this will inevitably, eventually, raise serious ethical issues. For example, my own work has contributed to our understanding of the connection between asteroids and meteorites. So asteroids are the objects that mostly orbit between Mars and Jupiter, and mostly in the inner part of that orbit, and some of them cross the Earth's orbit. And their bodies 10 to 100 kilometers across, a lot of bodies at one kilometer or smaller, we have discovered well in excess of 100,000 of these objects for which we now have good orbits. There's lots of them out there. There's lots of stuff out there. If you put them all together, they would still be much, much smaller than the moon. But there's a lot of surface area, which means there's a lot of exploitable area. Every now and then, these guys run into each other, knock chips off, and the chips then go into an orbit which might cross the orbit of other planets, including the Earth, might hit the Earth, and land in the form of what we call meteorites. While they're in orbit, coming towards the Earth, they're called meteoroids. When they're going through the atmosphere and making a streak, they're called, called meteors. And when they land and I pick them up and carry them into my lab, they are meteorites. Because we have the samples in our lab that we can measure, we can make some statements about the material that's out in the asteroid belt. There are many lines of evidence suggesting that ordinary chondrite meteorites, the most typical kind of meteorite that hit the Earth, can be derived from a particular relatively common spectral class of asteroids that are called the S-class. We know that many such asteroids are in orbits that pass near the Earth. Up to last year, there have been about 5,500 such asteroids already discovered 750 of those asteroids are larger than one kilometer in diameter. Many of them may at one time or another pass as close to the Earth as Earth-Moon. And we know we can get out to the Earth-Moon with our current technology because we did it 40 years ago. Human beings could go out there with a spade and a shovel and dig up the surface. Well, consider an asteroid of one kilometer radius Typical S-class asteroid has a density of about 2.5 times the density of water. That's 2,500 kilograms per cubic meter. So the total mass of one such asteroid is roughly 10 to the 13 kilograms. You know, you, you 
make the appropriate approximations, 4 thirds pi r cubed. If the composition of the asteroid is typical of the composition of a typical ordinary chondrite, it's about 10% metal. So that's 10 to the 13 divided by 10, 10 to the 12 kilograms of iron. Metal being mostly iron, but trace, traces of other elements, in fact, traces of every other metallic element in the periodic table in what we call cosmic abundances, in their relative abundances as they're formed in stars. So, 10 to the 12 kilograms of iron, that's 1 billion metric tons of iron in a 1 kilogram asteroid, of which there are nearly 1,000 that come close to the Earth. That's equal to the entire annual output of iron ore everywhere on Earth. And that's just the iron. You're also going to be getting platinum, gold, iridium, all sorts of other valuable materials. Um, I, yeah, I have one kilometer. I, sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you for uh, catching that. Um, yeah, it's a one kilometer radius object. So that's the relative value of the stuff you find in an asteroid. We're talking trillions of dollars worth of material. And there is one of these guys passing by nearly every year. Now, granted, given our normal technology, it would probably cost tens of billions of dollars to go out there and exploit it. But if you could invest the tens of billions of dollars to do it, you could get a payoff that would pay off. And it belongs to whoever gets there first. Not according to the treaty of the UN, but according to, you know, the, gold, the golden rule, whoever has the gold rules. <laughs> Question for you then. Would the exploitation of the mineral wealth from the asteroid belt lead to devastating disruptions in the economies of export, of, of you know, resource exporting nations. What is this going to do to the economies and the social life of most of Africa that depends on export of materials? What's it going to do to the cost of iron ore? What's it going to do to the nature of our, our manufacturing? The fact is, if you've got the resources up there and you've got free energy from solar power, why not send a robot and instead of sending the raw materials back here, do the processing up there? On the one hand, it's great. You've now taken all of this dirty industry off the surface of the earth. On the other hand, you've put a whole lot of people out of work. And you can start, you know, if you've got a robot who's doing the mining, why not another robot that's doing the manufacturing? And you've just put all of China out of work. What are the ethical implications of this kind of major shift, which is completely possible today if there were the economic and political will to do it, and which is going to certainly be more and more attractive in future years as resources become more limited and more likely to be found only in politically unstable areas. It's going to happen. The fact that I'm doing the research I'm doing now is accelerating the time when this is going to happen. Do I worry about that when I publish another paper about meteorites and asteroids? Should I be worried about it? All right, think of another, uh, another example. The, uh, the science fiction dream of, of living on other worlds, eventually that is going to become a reality, even though today, 40 years after we went to the moon, we've got to admit it's a lot more distant reality than we thought when I was a kid. But as we can see in our history of settling in the Americas, the availability of new land for colonization will inevitably lead to social disruptions, both in the new and the old world. Presumably, this is going to come without the problems of displacing indigenous peoples, unlike the uh, amazing stories cover, but such colonizations of these new worlds, unlike those of the previous centuries, will only be able to occur if we can successfully change those planets, if we can alter them to give them sustainable 
uh, they're, they're to make possible the sustainable presence of human and other life. The dream of colonizing Mars usually includes creating ways of increasing its atmospheric pressure and temperature, uh, a process called terraforming. To give you a simple example, you could spread the dark material from a uh, C-class asteroid or one of Mars's moons onto the pole caps, creating the kinds of polar, war uh, you know, global warming that we're trying to avoid here on Earth. The pole caps are mostly carbon dioxide, so if you boil them away and increase the carbon dioxide pressure, you could then create a really strong greenhouse on Mars so that the situation, the temperatures and the pressure could be high enough that liquid water could be stable. We now believe from the landers that we've had that there's a lot of ice just below the surface of the dust, especially in the polar regions. So you could then have releasing lakes, you could release a lot of water, between the carbon dioxide and the water, you've got oxygen present. You then seed it with plant life, that you know, anaerobic plant life that creates the oxygen. And in a few generations, maybe a thousand years, maybe we'll figure out a way to do it faster, Mars could be the kind of place where life could be sustained. Indeed, looking at the surface of Mars, we have evidence that it probably in the past was the kind of place where life could have been sustained because we can see evidence of riverbeds <coughs> that are now dried up but almost certainly were caused by flowing liquid water which meant there must have had a thicker atmosphere there must have been liquid water on the surface in higher temperatures great science fiction lovers dream but how many people have thought about the ethics of terraforming a planet first of all what if there's already life there? As a scientist, I get really worried about sending human beings to Mars because human beings leak. <laughs> and I'm terrified that we're going to finally get to Mars, discover life on Mars, and discover that that life is E. coli. And we'll never know, was the life something that we brought there ourselves, or was the life something that happened to farm in a parallel way on Mars or even that life started on Mars was carried from Mars to Earth in a little meteorite. The meteorites have cracks in them. That's one of the things I do is measure the size of the cracks. The cracks are big enough to carry small microbes. So there's no reason why you couldn't have viable microbes carried from the surface of Mars through one of those cracks onto the Earth. Maybe that's where Earth life was seeded from. Maybe we're actually all Martians. <laughs> and if you think that's a weird idea, I remind you that uh, the day on Mars is 24 hours and 39 minutes long. Now this morning, didn't you really want an extra 39 minutes in bed? <laughs> I think we have internal Martian clocks myself. <laughs> Here's a deeper question. What if there is no life on Mars or Titan or some other place we're going to go to, but all the ingredients are there such that at some future time life could exist, the potentiality of life is there. And by terraforming it, we're aborting that possibility. Under what circumstances is that an ethical thing to do? I throw it out as a question. I don't have a simple answer to it. Such issues are, admittedly, in the realm of science fiction. Other issues, however, are more immediate. Even an act, activity as passive as astronomy requires expensive equipment and telescopes in remote, often wilderness areas. Uh, this is a picture which, if the room were really, really dark, you could see. I'm not, this is the only picture that's going to do that. If you guys want to come on in, and there's you know, people in the, in the doorway, now is a good time because the, the pictures are boring, so you're not going to bother anybody. <laughs> but. Uh, this, this picture, I, was I put it up there to remind me, I went to a star party in western Oklahoma, one of the few places in America where it's really, really dark, so dark that you can see a shadow due to the Milky Way. This is what the sky used to look like everywhere, and it doesn't anymore. I suspect a majority of the students at this college have never seen the Milky Way. Think about that. Astronomy needs clear, dark skies. Does the need for clear, dark skies 
impede other human values and activities, including economic security, economic well-being. The uh, International Dark Sky Association works hard to restrict lighting in populated areas, the kind of lighting that impedes our vision of the night sky. But you can recognize that's planet Earth as it appears at night. Obviously, it's not picture taken at once because it's night everywhere in that picture. But you can see immediately where human beings most live. There are the areas that are totally lit up. Imagine trying to do astronomy in the east coast of the US anymore, in northern Europe, or in Japan. Um, one of the scarier things is that South Korea is completely lit up and North Korea is completely dark. Uh, clearly they love astronomy in North Korea. <laughs> the very I mean, the International Dark Sky Association is working really hard to make people aware of the problem of light pollution and what this does to our lives as human beings, what this does to wildlife, what this does. The, the trouble with over lighting cities is that, in fact, you create dark shadows that the bad guys can hide in. It actually makes cities less safe. But it gives you this illusion of security. On the other hand, the fact that the International Dark Sky Society has to work so hard to get laws passed to limit light pollution tells you that there is significant resistance to their efforts. For a whole lot of reasons, economic and psychological, a lot of people do not want their cities to be dark. Rural property owners are often adamant in the defense of their property rights to be able to control the use of their own land, including lighting in that property. And so to insist to them or to city people that dark skies are necessary so that a handful of astronomers 100 kilometers away can use their telescopes. That's justifiable only if you see that the work of astronomy has an intrinsic value in and of itself. And surely does not have an economic value. How do you convince people of this? And in fact, is this true? Is the value of astronomy sufficiently high to overcome the other good things that people are looking for when they try to light up their homes? Telescopes on the top of a mountain inherently infringe on other uses of the mountains. In Arizona, conflicts have arisen between the desires of astronomers, where you know, there's a telescope on the top of every mountain surrounding Tucson, compared to those who, on the one hand, want to keep the mountaintops completely untouched by human presence, or on the other hand, those who want to be able to exploit the mountaintops for other good things for human beings, from logging the timber there to building ski resorts. And there's nothing wrong with a ski resort. And you know, I like having things made out of wood. All of these things are good. They're all competing goods. Resolving these conflicts is no trivial task. On top of that, in a lot of places, not only Arizona, but also in Hawaii and Chile, issues have arisen between the astronomers and the local indigenous peoples who have a traditional or a religious association with the mountains on which the telescopes are placed. How you resolve those conflicts is a very tricky, tangled problem. I'll mention that uh, there is the additional problem we ran into in Arizona where some of the people defending the mountaintop are using the indigenous rights of the people in the area as one of their defenses. But that wasn't their original motivation. They had other reasons why they wanted the mountaintops to be untouched. Are they defending the indigenous people or are they exploiting the indigenous people in this defense? You know, it all depends whose side you're on, when, depending on what it looks like. It's a tricky ethical problem. And it's a serious one that astronomers have had to deal with. Radio astronomers, this is actually the Jodrell Bank radio telescope. The big dish is right behind the, uh, the tree there, so you can't see it. But I used this picture because I love the, the, the image there of the sign. Radio astronomers have encountered another kind of problem, attempting to keep clear certain parts of the radio spectrum that are in demand by commercial or navigation users. A lot of those users are people who depend on those radio bands for public safety reasons. 
there is a necessary ethical balance that has to be resolved between being sure that you have the bandwidth for Wi-Fi, I, I certainly want better Wi-Fi, the bandwidth so that uh, search and rescue teams can talk to each other, and the bandwidth so that a handful of people, some of whom are in this audience, can use the radio telescopes to look at far distant objects without interference. There's another kind of ethical problem. Um, the fellow in white who's standing next to me there is uh, helping me out in my scientific research by inspecting a particular meteorite. That meteorite is called Nakla, and we have really, really good reason to believe that it comes from Mars. Um, his first question to me was, of course, how do you know it comes from Mars? So I'll tell you what I told him. E per causa degli isotopi che si trovano in questo meteorite. And then I realized that his English was better than my Italian, so I switched to English. Um, actually, I'm reminded of, of, of an old, old song from the 1930s. It starts out, the moon belongs to everyone, the best things in life are free. But actually, moon rocks, at least those that have found their way to Earth, are anything but free. There's a thriving trade, and not always a legal trade, in the collection and the distribution of meteorites. And it has been fueled by the high value placed on lunar meteorites or those classes that we think come from Mars. A typical ordinary chondrite meteorite, a typical iron meteorite, sell basically for a few dollars per gram. But lunar meteorites and Martian meteorites will fetch in excess of $1,000 per gram. That rock that he's holding there would be worth probably $200,000 minimum if I split it up into small bits. And as, you know, and I could find 200,000 people with that kind of, you know, crazy money. Or 200 people, I guess. Or, you know, as a large lump. Um, a similar meteorite was actually put on auction with the asking price of a million dollars. They didn't get the money, but in the future, it's possible that you could. There was actually a similar type of meteorite, uh, a little more rare class, that went, the two pieces went for $10,000 per tenth of a gram to two Japanese collectors who bought two tenths of a gram of the meteorite. We have 15 grams of that meteorite. So if I could find 150 people that stupid, I'd have a fortune. <laughs> With such amounts of money changing hands, shady practices are inevitable. Some of the practices are obviously unethical, and you, know, you don't require a philosopher to figure that out. To steal a sample is wrong. To misrepresent a sample is wrong. To fake the provenance of a sample is wrong. All of those are clearly problems that anyone dealing in any kind of collectible item, whether it's artwork or a meteorite, are going to have to encounter. But in the meteorite collection business, which is the core of my own research, there also exist certain ethical issues that are more difficult to sort out. The trouble is, meteorites fall indiscriminately everywhere on Earth, equally. Oceans, land, cities, countryside, North Pole, equator. But the typical meteorite, at first glance, is hard to distinguish from a terrestrial rock to the casual observer. That, that's a meteorite. If you saw that in your driving, you know, your gravel, driveway, would you recognize it as a meteorite? I would have a hard time recognizing it as a meteorite even if I was just walking past it. I wouldn't notice it. More to the point, notice the little spots of red rust in that meteorite. Meteorites are full of iron. I talked about that before, 10% iron. That iron is mostly in the form of tiny flecks of metal, less than a millimeter across. And meteorites are permeated with a network of minor cracks. I talked about the porosity of meteorites. Cracks big enough for microbes to get in, cracks big enough for water vapor in the atmosphere to get in. So this is an ideal situation for the iron to turn itself into rust. As soon as it turns itself into rust, it expands because rust takes up more space than iron metal. It's got all that oxygen from the air coming in. And that splits the rock apart very quickly so that a, a rock that lands in Atlanta probably is not going to survive more than about 20 years before it turns into dust. 
sitting in your backyard. That means that the most fruitful places to look for meteorites are very dry desert regions. For instance, the dry deserts of Antarctica. Antarctica has got the extra advantage that the ice motions actually concentrate meteorites in certain regions, and meteorites are black, the ice is white. It's real easy to find them. <laughs> um, the picture I've shown up there is where I lived for six weeks in 1996. I was in the nearby tent. I could tell you long stories about life in a tent in Antarctica. But basically how we found the meteorites was to get all six of us onto skidoos and just go back and forth over the ice. And every time you found something that wasn't ice, you stopped and you picked it up. You put it in a bag and you sent it back to Houston. We're not the only ones looking for meteorites in the deserts. There are a whole class of Bedouin who have been going across the dry deserts of the Sahara looking for rocks in what are otherwise sandy regions. And they've been trained by, you know, economic uh, benefit to recognize meteorites when they see them. And they're not the ones who thought of it. If you know the, uh, the fellow whose name I can never pronounce who wrote the, the Little Prince, son, mumble, 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 mumble. Thank you, thank you. Somebody who can speak French. I can, if he was Italian, I could do it. In a French, I can't. But uh, he also wrote a wonderful book about night flying uh, from Paris to Dakar. And he described once landing in the desert because the plane broke down because it was 1925 and noticing meteorites in the, and he recognized them and described them as meteorites. He is right. Well, in the case of Antarctic meteorites, the problem of poaching meteorites isn't a problem. But both Antarctica and the desert regions are subject to national and international laws that may limit or control the removal of samples. In Antarctica, it's not an issue because the difficulty of getting there and of collecting the samples and getting out is such that only large scientific expedi expeditions organized or approved by government-sponsored research foundations can actually get to the samples. But that's not the case in the dry deserts. Some nations have specific laws against the removal of material, including specifically meteorites from their deserts. These laws, however, vary from nation to nation, and these laws have changed with time. Now, the law in the United States is that a meteorite is considered to be the property of the person who owns the land in which it's found. But meteorites are mostly found by dealers and collectors in remote areas. So it's very easy for them to claim that they found the sample wherever it's most convenient for them to have found the sample. Uh, one of the most prominent Martian meteorites is called, you know, meteorites are named for where they're found. One of them is called Los Angeles because the collector said, well, I was going through a bunch of rocks that I'd collected a long time ago and I noticed one of them was a meteorite. So, you know, technically I found it in my backyard. It must be mine. Yeah, right. But you can't prove where he did find it. You have to take his word for it. A lot of meteorite uh, collectors will make deals with local property owners so that if I find a meteorite, I'll claim it was on your land and we'll split the proceeds. And there's no way you can stop them. North African nations have only recently recognized that meteorites have a commercial value. And so only recently they've begun to restrict their, airport, their export as national treasures. But the laws are different from nation to nation, so it's very easy for a Bedouin to say, oh, no, no, I did not find this in Libya. I found this in Algeria where the laws are different. And as I say, meteorites are named for where they're found. There's a whole class of meteorites that are just called North Africa because nobody wants to say where they came from. Part of it also is that the collectors don't want people to know where they've looked and where they haven't looked. And so they're very wary about saying where they came from for that reason. And that's legitimate. You know, they're making their money doing the collecting. It costs them money to go out and pick them up. Well, part of the issue, too, is that a meteorite has no intrinsic value. You know, really cheap meteorites are given away in boxes of cereal. In terms of their mineral wealth, they're worthless. 
So why should you have to declare a value when you export them? Just because you can sell it for $1,000, that's only because some crazy collector is willing to pay you $1,000. The scientific value of a meteorite is impossible to quantify monetarily. The value of the meteorite is only what the collector market will bear. And so the value of such meteorites can be manipulated by dealers and by governments who have the power to make samples more or less readily available to the public. Ethical questions immediately arise there. But for me, as the meteorite scientist, a very real ethical question is, is it ethical to do research on meteorite samples that may have been either collected or transported from their countries of origin in a manner that's contrary to the local laws. For instance, problem came up, a meteorite dealer found what he thinks is a lunar meteorite in the deserts of Australia. Any meteorite collected after 1930 in Australia is the property of the Australian government. He found an aged uh, you know, farmer out in the middle of nowhere who says, oh no, I picked this up in 1928 when I was, you know, uh-huh, right. Um, this is being challenged. He needs the meteorite authenticated as a lunar meteorite, so he brings it to your lab, which is getting funding from NASA or NSF to do scientific research. And it's against one of the post-Watergate laws to use a government grant to violate the law of another country, a law that was left over from the days when uh, Aerospace companies would bribe, you know, generals in other countries to buy their uh, products. Are you putting your NSF grant at risk by measuring a meteorite that if you believe the collector is legal, but you and he and everybody really suspects it isn't legal? Is it even ethical, forget the law, to do research on a meteorite that has been collected illegally? You, as a scientist, may have had no role at all in violating the law. The law may have changed during the time the sample was obtained. The legality of the sample may be impossible to determine. But even if the sample was clearly obtained contrary to so another nation's laws, you know that there's valuable science that can be done from studying the sample. So what is the ethical practice for a meteoriticist in such a situation? Interesting question. Even more than that, the very research that you do on the sample will alter the value of the sample and raise the risk of further illegal or immoral practices. For instance, in 1996, this meteorite, Island Hills 84001, was shown to have these little traces that some people said were evidence of fossil life. As a result, the value of these kinds of meteorites went through the roof. By showing the scientific value of these meteorites, the researchers affected their monetary value. It was, in fact, this discovery that inspired all the Bedouin to go out and look for more similar meteorites in the African desert. And thanks to that, we've actually tripled the number of Martian meteorites because they found thousands of meteorites, among which were a significant number, about two dozen meteorites of the class we believe come from Mars. So if it weren't for the collectors and the value, we wouldn't have the samples. You know, you can't complain about that. But it's all tied into the ethical means of getting the samples and the benefit that we as scientists derive from having the samples. Another thing comes up, a guy comes up and he says, I've got a meteorite, I saw this fall in my backyard, I know it's from Mars. And you look at the meteorite and you notice that there's a large metal bolt in the back. And you say, you know, I think this maybe is a, a piece of slag or a piece of some kind of machinery that was made in the factory down the road. You know, and he says, why do you say that? Well, look at the bolt. He says, ah, oh, evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence. <laughs> and they work in inches. There has been at least one case where the collector has taken the meteorite scientist to court for refusing to certify his sample as being a lunar or a Martian meteorite when he's absolutely convinced that it is. I end.
with a more personal story involving the general ethics of doing astronomy. 25 years ago, before I was a Jesuit, I worked as a researcher at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I was modeling the interiors of the icy moons of Jupiter and Saturn. And then, late at night, lying in bed, pondering my life, I was troubled. You know, why was I wasting my time worrying about the moons of Jupiter when people were starving in the world? Wasn't this a just an utter waste of all of my efforts and talents? It's an utterly meaningless activity. I couldn't handle it anymore. I finally decided to quit being a scientist and go join the Peace Corps. I went to the Peace Corps. I said, I'll go anywhere you ask me to go. I'll do anything you ask me to do. And they took me. They sent me to Kenya. And two months after I arrived in Kenya, I was at the University of Nairobi teaching astronomy to graduate students. <laughs> Every weekend, I found myself traveling up country to remote villages with a small telescope. And I'd show off the stars and the planets. And I actually had an astronomy club at uh, the local high school there. 